Russia has for weeks been massing troops and tanks along the Ukrainian border. Tensions along Ukraine's border have been rising for months, along with warnings about a possible Russian invasion. President Biden says a Russian invasion of Ukraine would be the largest invasion since World War II. There have been suggestions in recent days that the crisis is coming to a head. The U.S. continues to deliver military supplies and weapons. What is Russia signaling? In just a few days after our last episode, the U.N. Security Council hosted an emergency meeting at its headquarters in New York City. It was a last-ditch effort to stop what would become a worst-case scenario in Eastern Europe. I give the floor to the permanent representative of Kenya. Thank you, Mr. President. I That's Martin Kimani, Kenya's representative. And when he turned on his microphone on the eve of a full-scale Russian power grab, he was thinking of colonialism. Kenya and almost every African country was birthed by the ending of empire. Our borders were not of our own drawing. They were drawn in the distant colonial metropoles of London, Paris, and Lisbon, with no regard for the ancient nations that they cleaved apart. Kimani was warning the room. Mr. President, this situation echoes our history. That when Vladimir Putin addressed Russians just hours before, recognizing the independence of two eastern Ukrainian territories, Donetsk and Luhansk, he was pushing a dangerous nostalgia. One that says old maps are worth the price of war. We chose to follow the rules of the Organization of African Unity and the United Nations Charter, not because our border satisfied us, but because we wanted something greater forged in peace. Putin insisted that Russia had to invade Ukraine to protect a Russian-speaking minority from Ukrainian attack. Amid blatant lies and propaganda, he claimed that he was just looking out for the little guy. State media ran footage supposedly showing Russia was evacuating civilians from Donetsk and Luhansk. And officials claimed anti-Russian mobs were targeting Russian speakers. But Kimani, among a growing number of thinkers, wanted the Security Council to know that a Russian invasion of a country with decades of independence under its belt and a democratically elected government would have nothing to do with defense. It would be a blatant, bloody land grab. We must complete our recovery from the embers of dead empires in a way that does not plunge us back into new forms of domination and oppression. Maybe this sounds like a mic drop moment. The speech did quickly go viral. But Albania's ambassador reminded the room that this concept is not new. Putin was singing an old song from a decades-old playbook. What happened today is nothing less but a bis repetita of what we have seen in Georgia in 2008 and with Crimea in 2014, meaning an aggression by fabrication of phantom republics. Who is next? War has been a steady thrum in Ukraine since 2014, when just like now, the UN was having frantic Security Council meetings, trying to bring Russia back from the brink. They held 26 sessions, in fact, before then Ambassador Samantha Power stood up. If our message and the message of other countries today on the deteriorating situation in eastern Ukraine sounds familiar, it is for good reason. For while the situation has evolved, the root of the problem remains the same. Russia's flagrant violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And, well, here we are again. A Russian invasion that's steeped in tens to hundreds of years of history. So in this bonus episode, we're dropping everything. Because we wanted to ask, how did we get here? And what do we need to know about empire, expansionism, and Vladimir Putin to wrap our heads around this moment in Ukraine? Experiencing the news each day can feel like a journey. With Up First from NPR, it doesn't have to be. Welcome to 15 easy minutes of breaking news, clarity on international and national affairs, all handed over not from some floating voice in the sky, from us, Layla, A, Steve, and me, Rachel. Start your day informed. Subscribe to Up First wherever you get your podcasts. Before we start, let's get this out of the way. It is impossible to know exactly what Vladimir Putin's true intentions are in this conflict. But we thought a good place to start 
might be with what he's already shown and told us about how he sees his country, its legacy, and his place in that story. And to really dig into that question, we knew exactly who to ask. My name is Terrell Jermaine Starr. I am the host of the Black Diplomats podcast, and I am currently in Kiev and praying to Black Jesus that an airstrike doesn't kill me. Terrell is a journalist, and he's also a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. And when we spoke with him over Zoom, he was at a friend's house, looking very tired. This is my first time reporting in a war situation. So I'm learning how to do that. It's extremely stressful, and I just have to gather up the gumption to do the best I can. Russia had just launched its invasion, which Putin was calling a, quote, special military operation. A decidedly underwhelming term for amassing over 150,000 troops at the Ukrainian border. I have heard sirens going off all day. I have heard fighter jets, military jets, scrambling across the skies because commercial airspace is closed. And on the streets of the city, he's seen the hallmarks of a country fully at war. Long ATM lines, crowds rushing to escape. People are desperately trying to leave, go to their dachas in the country trying to go west if they can do that, because it's important to note that everyone may not have the financial resources to travel to the west. But while the intensity of Russia's invasion has surprised a lot of foreign affairs experts, Terrell is quick to point out that this isn't Ukraine's first run-in with Putin. So Ukrainians have been at war with Russia since 2014, after Ukrainians fought to unseat the Ukrainian president, Viktor Yanukovych, who was a puppet of the Kremlin. And this country has seen more than 1.5 million people that we know of internally displaced out of the Crimean region, out of Luhansk and Donbass. More than 14,000 people have died, soldiers, civilians, in this war. And so what's happening right now is not a new invasion. It's a continuation of the occupation that has already taken place. Russia's most recent escalation has a lot to do with the country's post-Soviet trajectory. Since the Soviet Union collapsed in the 90s, countries that were once controlled by Russia, like Ukraine and Georgia, have aligned more closely with NATO and its Western democratic values. It's a trend that Putin has repeatedly called a threat to Russia. I've been in Ukraine since 2009. And the strides that this country has taken have been breathtaking. In a Ukrainian election, they're competitive and you don't know who's going to win, unlike Russia. But the way that Terrell puts it, this crisis has more to do with Putin's interpretation of the decades leading up to Ukraine's independence, a moment in history that the Russian president believes never should have happened. What's happening with Ukrainians is that Putin is shutting down any discussion of Ukrainian agency, Ukrainian history, anything that is distinct from Russia for these people. This is not about geopolitics. If we don't understand that, we're not going to get to the genesis of Putin's speech and why he's doing what he's doing, because Ukrainians are refusing to submit. And if somebody does not submit, We beat them and beat them and beat them until we break it. And Black people have this history in America. And we understand that well because I am a student of history. I understand it. That's why it's so visceral to me. I understand exactly what he's doing. That's what he's doing to Ukrainian people. Terrell says that this is the only lens that makes sense for Russian actions that otherwise seem unexplainable. Like Putin announcing the war— while Ukraine's U.N. ambassador, Sergei Kistitsa, joined a table of leaders desperate to keep the peace. Before I try to deliver parts of the statement that I came here with tonight, most of it is already useless since 10 p.m. New York time, because it's too late, my dear colleagues, to speak about the escalation. Too late. The Russian president declared the war on the record. Shall I play the video of your president? Ambassador, shall I do that right now? Or you can confirm it. Russia's Vasily Nabinzia was actually presiding over the session, gavel in hand. Do not interrupt me, please. Thank you. Then don't ask me questions when you are speaking. Proceed. And here, the tension between Russia's narrative and the Ukrainians' truth 
was on full display. Well, as I said, relinquish your duties as a chair. Call Putin, call Lavrov to stop aggression. There is no purgatory for war criminals. They go straight to hell, Ambassador. I wanted to say in conclusion that we aren't being aggressive against the Ukrainian people, but against the junta that is in power in Kiev. This meeting is adjourned. In defending Russia's invasion, Nabinzia was trying to legitimize Putin's claim that somehow Russia was the victim. He used language that Ukraine's ambassador later called lunacy. You have to look at this in racial terms. And you have to look at this in colonial terms, but specifically racial terms. Putin does not want this nation to exist. He's never appreciated the agency of Ukraine, but neither did leadership before him after 1991. Neither did the Soviet Union. Neither did the czars. In centuries of Russian history, Ukraine was never a real state. So what Putin is saying is a repeat of the Soviet leaders before him and the czarist leaders before the Soviet leadership. Because Russia is not just a country. It is also an empire. When you think about the big colonial powers, maybe the English, the Spanish, or the Ottomans come to mind. But the Russians also once ran one of the largest empires in history. It fell in the early 20th century, but Terrell says that Russia, especially led by Putin, hasn't relinquished its imperial values. Far from it, which is crucial to understanding its decision to invade Ukraine again. So contemporarily, what this means is that all you have to do if you are the Russian Federation, is to take the playbook from the Tsarist era and from the Soviet era, is divide and conquer. You know, when you think about colonialism, and I, and I understand you, Lacey, you, you're, you're a student of history yourself, when you think about the manner in which the Belgians colonized certain parts of Africa, right, and divided the different ethnic groups against one another, that's what essentially what Putin does. You know, the funny thing when people ask me about Russia, you know, because I've only been one time, they say, what's well, wrong, is it cold there? They're referring to Siberia. But the thing about Siberia was that that was not in, that was not Russian land. That was indigenous land. It never belonged to Russia. They, they took it and they killed the indigenous people like America did. And so if you are a country that is used to colonialization and you have never moved away from that model, you have a institutional framework that tells you you have the right to determine geography based on occupying territory that you believe is divinely belonging to you. And so you see it in Georgia, for example, with the South Ossetia and the Abkhazia regions where in 2008, where I was when the Russians invaded, because this is not my first time at Putin's rodeo, there were decades-old grievances that the Abkhazians and South Ossetians, who are, which are different ethnic groups, right? They're Georgians, but they're different ethnic groups, with the government in Tbilisi. And even to this day, people in Tbilisi would say, hey, there are ways that we could have handled these conflicts better. What Russia does is that it manipulates these grievances to say, hey, we are on your side. And then they put in puppet leaders because they don't even serve their own people properly, even though their own people have legitimate grievances against the legal entity government, right? So what Putin does is says that, hey, we are going to protect you from these murderous Georgians. And so you claim independence, then that justifies us sending troops there. That is a very contemporary form of colonialism. He is doing the same thing in the Luhansk and Donbass region. And what does he actually say that he wants here beyond uh, what he may actually want? That he would protect Russian speakers, and even though these are the people who are being killed, and Russian speakers are entering the military in order to fight the Russian military, there is this falsehood that Russian speakers are oppressed. That's just false. I'll give you an example. I speak Russian. I'm not Pushkin. But that's the language that I use to communicate when I'm traveling across this country, even into the West, where it's very much Ukrainian. I don't have any problems 
And my friend Andre, he went to a Ukrainian language school in the South, which is predominantly Russian speaking. So people would go to Ukrainian school, but speak Russian outside the class. What makes this an issue is the fact that Russia has tried to control and manipulate the populations here that came through as a result of mass migrations during Catherine the Great's period during the late 1700s. And so these conflicts are manufactured. What he's saying is that he wants to avert a war, and which is insane because Ukraine has never waged war against Russia. It does not have the capacity to do so. If anything, Russia is making its language a threat, but the language itself is not something that is an issue until the Kremlin makes it one. So the thing about colonialism is that they make up lies about people, because if you have to subjugate people to being less than human or being less than you, because racism is irrational, let's just say that, he makes these irrational claims about Ukrainians because see, if you can lead, delegitimize a people, then you can justify correcting their behavior because they're not people anyway. What do you think Putin wants really here? Putin wants to cripple and pretty much exterminate Ukraine. That sounds very extreme. I know that sounds extreme, but no one thought that we would get to this point. I'm going to continue to voice this because if I don't voice it, I don't want to be noted in history as not really pushing how serious Putin's genocidal mentality is. He does not want Ukraine to exist. He wants Ukraine to be an oblast in Russia, which is why he took over the Luhansk and Donbass regions, recognizing them illegally, which is essentially an annexation. He wants Ukraine to be a Belarus, for example. If it can't be an oblast, he wants it to be a satellite state. But regardless of anything Putin might say or want, Terrell says the Ukrainians aren't having any of it. Ukrainians are responding with what I would describe as hatred. And I hate to say this, but I have to tell you the truth. Ukrainians would rather die than be under Putin's control. And I say that with a heavy heart because there are friends here who I love and care for. They're not going to live under Putin's control. They will die. Just look at Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who's been leading the resistance from Kiev. He knows he's a top priority for a Russian strike. The U.S. even offered to get him out of the country. His response? I need ammunition, not a ride. And that attitude is the same on the streets. Soon after we spoke with Terrell, he interviewed a friend, a man named Andre, live on CNN as they drove through the city. Your family is um, in Poland. Do they worry about you staying behind? Did they ask you why did you decide to stay behind and not be with them? They did not ask me that. They gave me a big hug. They know what I'm doing. And what do you think will happen, Andre, if you and others take to the streets to fight the Russians? Well, I expect to see a battle. I expect to see a, a gun battle, and I expect to see that we're going to send them a message that they are not welcome here, let's put it this way. We all definitely realize what can happen, and I'm in touch with my family right now, and we just need to get this done. Terrell has heard the same from strangers. Only Ukraine will Only win. Only Ukraine will win. Fuck Russians. We'll kill everybody for our land. It's our land. Okay, guys, do you see what people have to say about that? And all of this got me thinking how, in America, there's so much tension around using the word colonialism, around our legacy and others. So I asked Terrell, does he get pushback from people when he calls Russian aggression colonialist? You know, I don't care anymore. I spent much of my career challenging white supremacy and calling out racism for what it is. So... I've developed a hardened skin for people who who try to tell me that I shouldn't go there. Speaking of Americans, lawmakers' reactions to the invasion have been all over the place. That's shocking, I know. Terrell says that the way that Congress has responded is troubling. For one, 
you have a GOP that has a very passive, incestuous relationship with authoritarianism, let's not make a mistake about this. The authoritarianism that's taking place in Russia and what's happening against Ukraine is what GOP leadership is doing across the South in regards to voting rights, in regards to redlining, in regards to critical race theory, in regards to transgender people and people who are LGBTQ. And so they are very much linked in that regard. I worry about Democrats when they deal with these type of issues like Ukraine, because it deals with a larger issue of, you know, we, we have to redefine what safety means. So the messaging on why Ukraine matters is lacking and Democrats have the moral integrity to do it, but they don't have the language. Or I would dare say the the regional knowledge, I think, to really adequately address these issues. And so most people who are elected to office are not elected to office because of their foreign policy chops. That's the main issue that I see and what concerns me. The both parties worry me, but for very different reasons. What should Americans be reflecting on in this moment as we look at what's happening in Ukraine? As we're reflecting on what's happening in Ukraine, I would encourage Americans to think about what safety means and think about America's military and how it has behaved. The the type of fear that I felt earlier this morning, the anxiety I felt about airstrikes, about an invasion. I really was scared. And I was ashamed to say that I was scared. Don't be ashamed to say that you're scared. I, I'm, just, I'm sitting here right now and I'm thinking what those Iraqis felt when American troops invaded their country. I'm thinking about Haiti, which is occupied by the United States. What did those Haitians think? I'm thinking about South America. Americans need to really reflect about our own military, because here in Ukraine, people are asking Russians, don't you have any shame? You're okay with this? I'm pretty sure people across the Middle East and Iran and Iraq, Yen, South America are saying, Americans, are you okay with this? The way that they're abusing us? And there just seems to be a different tone and attitude about the reaction when abuse happens to people who are not people of color versus what happens in the Middle East and South America and Asia. Different reactions. And as somebody who loves Ukraine, as somebody who is in this country right now, I, in my efforts to be intellectually honest, have to be reflective about that. I so appreciate you talking with us and taking this time, especially with everything that's going on right now, uh, thank you so much, and and please stay safe. Thank you. That was Terrell Germain Star. But before we let you go, I want to play you one more thing. That's a scene from Moscow, just after the start of the invasion. Thousands of Russians have been arrested in anti-war protests across the country, including in St. Petersburg, Putin's hometown. It's a dangerous act of resistance and love for Ukraine, their neighbor, where so many Russians live, have family, and share history. We'll be back with our regularly scheduled programming, Congress and foreign policy, sanctions, as luck would have it, in two weeks. Things That Go Boom is distributed by Inkstick Media and PRX. This episode was produced by Christina Stella, Katie Toth, and me, and edited by Layla Ujeli and Nikki Galtalin. As always, Darian Shulman writes the music for our show, and Robin Wise makes each episode sound its very best. Thank you to the supporters and foundations that make our work possible. The Carnegie Corporation of New York, and Plowshares Fund, as well as Ink Stick supporters, including the Cologne Foundation, Craig Newmark Foundation, Prospect Hill Foundation, and the Jubitz Family Foundation. If you're listening and you like what we do, please don't forget to head on over and leave us a review. 
And come visit us anytime on social at Inkstick Media. If you'd like to donate to organizations supporting the thousands of Ukrainian refugees fleeing this war, we've included some links in our show notes. We'll see you soon.